Hi, everyone. I'm Larry Platt from the Philadelphia Citizen. Welcome to Philly Thinks Big, uh, another installment of our uh, real estate development for good series. Uh, the last time we all gathered for this was uh, here at the Fittler Club in uh, November. We had a couple of great events up in the uh, dining room, and now, the, now here we are in the, uh, in the ballroom. Uh, it's wonderful to see all of these unmasked, smiling, healthy faces after all this time. Um, I want to give a big shout out to our venue partner, uh, Fittler Club here. Um, if you are not a member of Fittler Club, you should look into it. And uh, Ralph of the Citizen, who is checking people in, if you want to take a tour of Fittler Club, give her your name, and at, at the end, uh, there'll be some folks from Fittler Club who, who will be happy to take you around. Um, it's awesome. It's a, it's a Philadelphia jewel. Uh, and, and I'm here, like, every day. Um, so... There's that. Um, so, and I want to begin by thanking our sponsors, uh, Brandywine Realty Trust, Central Philadelphia Development Corporation, Clark & Cohen, Darko Capital, First Trust Bank, HRP, and the Bellwether District, JLL, Post Brothers, and Shift Capital. Uh, they make this series uh, possible. Just a couple of um, uh, things to note for upcoming events. Uh, Monday, May 9th, we'll be back here for an event um, that, that we're, we're calling Run for Something, but I like to call it um, uh, taking on the gerontocracy in politics. If you're, if you're tired of old fart politics, uh, we have, uh, uh, we're bringing in um, three young women who are taking on the status quo in politics. Uh, Amanda Littman is the author of Run for Something and the founder of a nonprofit called, of the same name, that recruits young people to run for public office. Uh, she'll be joined by State Representative Joanna McClinton, uh, who many of you know, a uh, dynamic Delaware County, uh, uh, Delaware County uh, uh, state representative. And uh, as, as well as um, Mayor Paige Cognetti from Scranton, Pennsylvania, who uh, as an independent ran against an entrenched political machine with a killer kick-ass slogan, Paige against the machine, uh, upset the machine and is doing tremendous work in Scranton. And it feels like in my dream of dreams that that could be a game plan for Philadelphia. We just have to find someone named Paige uh, to, make, to make the circle complete. Um, so that's on, that's on May 9th. On Friday evening, May 20th, we'll be uh, with, again with our partners from Drexel University and the Lindy Institute uh, co-hosting the next Development for Good event, Olmsted 200, a screening of Frederick Law Olmsted, Designing America, a film, uh, followed by a conversation with the filmmaker and a panel of experts about the great landscape designer's legacy in America. Uh, that's May 20th in the AJ Picture Gallery at Drexel, so, so uh, uh, just a few blocks away. And on Tuesday morning, May 31st, I'll be right back here with another dynamic bald man, uh, MSNBC anchor and citizen board member, Ali Velshi, uh, straight from covering the war uh, in Ukraine, where he was uh, on the front lines. He will be uh, spending the morning telling us about some moving anecdotes, some smart analysis, and some musings on the state of journalism in this perilous age. So please, uh, you won't want to miss that. I like to say Ali Velshi is the smartest bald man on TV, but the fact is he may just be the smartest man on TV. Um, finally, I can't get off stage here without just giving a plug for the citizen. What we're trying to do is uh, to def defibrillate democracy in the American city where it was born. Uh, you know, we've, we celebrate tragically 
in this city when we have 25% voter turnout. And there are a bunch of us, local patriots all, who think that that's just not acceptable. So everything we're doing, whether it's solutions journalism on the site, whether it's thought leadership events like this that are aimed towards making things better, or some of our calls to civic action, like when we give $10,000 to a random voter to try and jumpstart turnout. It's all aimed to try and make good on the promise of uh, those, those white dudes in wigs uh, 200 and some odd years ago. Um, so if you care to join this movement uh, for democracy, for, for defibrillating democracy, um, go to our website, make a pledge. Uh, we, we can't do this without you. We really want to cultivate over this next year a, uh, an army of citizens that takes, takes our city back from the 300 insiders who have also always run uh, this town. So with that, uh, I'm really excited about what these guys are going to talk about. We need big ideas and ambition in Philadelphia. Um, the curse of Philadelphia has long been incrementalism. Uh, and so they're going to talk about some big ideas that can change the city. And with that, I, here comes uh, Philly Thinking Big. Thank you all. Hello. Can you hear me? I'm David Brownlee. Uh, I'm David Brownlee. And I'm delighted to welcome you on behalf of the Lindy Institute for Urban Innovation at Drexel and on behalf of its executive director, Harris Steinberg. The Lindy Institute worked with the Philadelphia Citizen to put together tonight's program, and I'm very sorry that Harris, who is one of this city's most important thinkers and doers, is today engaged in an unwanted medical adventure. Um, I hope that, we, that he can feel the supportive warmth in this room. Harris, we're with you. This program was inspired by the spring issue of Context, the magazine of the Philadelphia chapter of the American Institute of Architects. Um, the, uh, the paper uh, was not available to print Context yet, um, part of the supply chain uh, problems that we are all encountering. Um, but I'm told that as soon as we can find enough electrons, the digital version will be available at aiaphiladelphia.org. The spring issue is called Big Things Are Happening in Philadelphia, and it was conceived and edited by Harris, Julie Bush, and myself to call attention to the bigness of recent doings in this city that is famous for underreporting its achievements. There are articles on the skyscraperization of West Philadelphia, Penn's new hospital, Penn's landing, and the Parkway rethink, plus a roundtable with three Philadelphia's three of Philadelphia's big thinkers. Philadelphia has done big things before. Of course, Penn's plan to start with, the original Parkway, and Society Hill. But these articles in Context Magazine explore how building big means building differently today. Two of the authors are among tonight's panelists. Now some thank yous. Thank you. Tom Devaney and Ryan Diebold of the Lindy Institute, and a profound thanks to the Lindy Family Charitable Foundation, which has supported this event. Thank you, Larry Platt, Roxanne Patel Shapalalvi, and, uh, and Corey Moscow of the Philadelphia Citizen. And thank you to the Fiddler Club for this wonderful venue. And finally, one introduction. Martha Cross is Deputy Director of Philadelphia's Department of Planning and Development. Her bailiwick is planning and zoning, and so she works with the Planning Commission, the Historical Commission, the Art Commission, and the Zoning Board of Adjustment. Martha has a BA, B. Arch from, from Carnegie Mellon and a Master's in City Planning from Penn. She began her career working as an urban designer in the private sector, and then she oversaw development activities for a nonprofit real estate company in Baltimore and New Jersey. And, and she joined the city in 2017. In recent years, she's taught urban design at Drexel. Martha. Thanks, David. I, that was a really generous um, background. I feel like I've, I've 
feel badly that I won't be doing as much for all of our <laughs> panelists. Uh, as David said, I work in the Division of Planning and Zoning in the city's Department of Planning and Development, and I've been there for about four and a half years. So the city and the Department of Planning and Development have learned a lot in the last two years. Between COVID and its resulting health and economic challenges, the brutal murder of George Floyd and the community's response, and hurricanes and storms and their aftermath. All of these events have really shined a light on the city's racial and socioeconomic disparities. And they also highlighted the importance of the city's civic spaces, whether it's related to social distancing, public protests, health or resiliency, Philadelphians are talking about the public realm and we're listening. So what does that mean for planning in the city of Philadelphia? Well, in our department, our staff has really shifted their approach to projects. And we call it, we didn't make this up, but we call it moving at the speed of trust. This means that our project timelines include significant community outreach so that we can really absorb the feedback that we hear. We're also working to value lived experience as expertise and to engage with people right at square one, not after we've collected data or already proposed solutions. And we're doing this in several projects now, and I'll mention three. One is the Roundhouse, it's the city's former police headquarters. The second I'll talk about is the Historical Commission's Cultural Resources Survey Plan and Pilot Project. And finally, an update to the city's comprehensive plan. The Roundhouse represents different things to different people. It's an architectural marvel. It's also the site of enormous pain and suffering. It's urban renewal and it's police brutality. Asking someone to redevelop this site absent that context would be foolish. In the past, the city has made public engagement part of the developer's responsibility and as part of the condition of sale. But now we're taking that on before the developer RFP. And we've engaged a consultant uh, to help us with the civic engagement around that project. But let me be clear, this is a redevelopment project and that is our intention uh, for the site to actually, or the building to be redeveloped but we're opening conversations about what's important to that development, to, for that development to reflect. Next, following the mayor's historic preservation task force recommendation, the historical commission sought to create an ongoing citywide survey of historic resources. But the historical commission staff and commission itself knew that the, the, the city's history is more than bricks and mortar, and that traditional preservation tools would not recognize all Philadelphians, the history of all Philadelphians. So as a result, they're pursuing a public engagement process to understand what should be preserved, both the tangible and the intangible, history and culture, and how it should be preserved. Finally, it's been 10 years since the City Planning Commission started its Phila 2035 plan. Can you believe it? Our planners use it in their work daily, uh, but it needs an update. So over the last nine months, we've been working with the ste steering committee, um, Philadelphians from across all sorts of sectors of the city. They've been compensated for their time and they're helping us decide what can and should be part of this plan. Before we even start to conceive the plan, we're taking it to Philadelphians to talk about what it needs to be. Once we've got that process done, then we'll design a civic engagement process, and finally start to actually update the comprehensive plan. So this shift in planning process is difficult. It's less predictable. It requires the city to be flexible, something perhaps it is not known for being, uh, but it's necessary. It's the only way not to repeat the mistakes of the past and to put planning for the future of Philadelphia into the hands of all Philadelphians. And with that, I'd like to begin our panel. So I'm going to briefly introduce all of our panelists, and then they'll each give an overview of their project. Following that, David and I will ask a few questions, and then we'll turn it over to the audience to hear what you have to ask. So tonight we're gonna to start with Diana Lind, on the far end of the stage. Uh, she's the Vice President of Community and Culture at the Chamber of Commerce for Greater Philadelphia and a board member of the Philadelphia Citizen. 
And she's going to talk to us about the big ideas for a place that has always been part of a large vision for the city, the Benjamin Franklin Parkway. And then next, we'll talk to Greg Reeves, founder and co-owner of Mosaic Development Partners, who will speak to a big vision for the Navy Yard that has the potential to impact a much larger community. And finally, Julie D'Onofrio, managing director at Penn Praxis, who will tell us about a transformative engagement around the I-95 cap and the effort to create a park for all Philadelphians. Diana, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Martha. Uh, thanks to The Citizen for hosting this event. It's great to see so many people here for this conversation. Um, <clears throat> I guess I'd love to take a, a little bit of a poll to start off. Who here loves the parkway? Raise your hands. And who here thinks the parkway could be better than it currently is, right? I think most of us um, agree that the parkway could be better than, um, than what it currently looks like right now. And we're in a lucky position that the city has um, issued, it issued an RFP for a design to Re to renovate, to re-envision, re-imagine the parkway. Um, from that RFP, it uh, selected three finalists. From those finalists, it uh, selected um, design workshop um, and its 10 subcontractors to create this new vision for the parkway. Um, and it's something that has real potential to have a tremendous impact on the city of Philadelphia. And, um, the essay that I wrote for context was really about um, not only being tremendously excited for this new vision for the parkway, but also thinking that um, in Philadelphia, we need not just to transform the engineering, the landscape, uh, the physical of the parkway, but we really need to start changing people's minds around how we, um, what our expectations are for public spaces, um, how we think about investing in spaces like the parkway. Um, so just to kind of level set for, um, for everyone, um, the, the proposed idea from Design Workshop is, um, is really to take the parkway back from cars, um, which are the main aspect of the parkway right now, right? Um, it's to pedestrianize dramatically a uh, tremendous amount of space on the parkway, um, turning Logan Circle back into its intended square as part of you know, William Penn's plan. It would be to turn Eakins Oval into a um, much more pedestrianized space connecting the parkway down to the Schuylkill waterfront where there's proposals for a water taxi, for swimming in the Schuylkill, for um, all sorts of activities on the waterfront. Um, along the parkway, there would be architectural follies um, to kind of uh, guide people along the spaces there, pollinator gardens, real intentional um, effort to increase the sustainability of the parkway um, and really transform this space from being um, what is, you know, primarily kind of like a commuter space right now, um, a, a space to get people to and from to a place that really prioritizes Philadelphians. And one of the points that I, I make in the essay is that um, we have to make some tough choices if we want to see this parkway through um, this vision. It's not about sort of win-wins for everyone. We can't appease um, people who are commuting down Kelly Drive and also get a parkway that's going to be um, pedestrianized and used by bicyclists and equitable to people who don't have cars. We are going to have to start making some choices here. Um, and I think that it's really, um, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a mind shift for uh, the parkway was created in many ways to kind of ennoble Philadelphians, to kind of lift us up with its beautiful architecture and its grandeur, and you can't help but feel that. And then yet, when you're on the parkway, you also see how it's currently cut through by traffic, highways, there's a decent homeless population, the, the museums are beautiful, but they sort of can feel inaccessible. And so, um, if we're going to um, kind of transform this parkway, we need to kind of um, 
recognize that it's, it's a bit like America itself at this moment. It's ambitious and a beautiful idea, but it also needs um, to be jolted. It needs to, uh, it's broken, um, and it needs to be, and it's imperfect, and needs to be kind of rethought. So um, this is a real opportunity, I think, for, for Philadelphia to, um, to think not only about what the parkway could be as a public space, but as an opportunity for us to start thinking about how we approach big projects in Philadelphia. So when you look at other cities, um, you know, you could look at the dramatic um, uh, ways in which European cities like Barcelona or Milan or Stockholm have kind of prioritized um, average people over car, um, car drivers and, and users. Um, but you also could look at other cities like, say, um, New York, where um, you know, the city decided to close Times Square to pedestrians. And that was at first looked at as a, um, you know, a terrible idea for business, for, um, for traffic getting through Times Square. But little did people know that if you created some space for tourists and residents to kind of sit back and relax there, that actually it would, be, it would become a place where people would actually want to spend more time. They would spend more money at the stores, et cetera. Um, there are other precedents in places like, you know, obviously the big dig is often looked at in Boston, which was, a tremendous you know, effort to change a kind of rusty old city into a green and beautiful one. And maybe we don't want to you know, spend as much money or time as Boston did on the, on the big dig, but it had a tremendous effect. And I really doubt that Boston would be um, the kind of front runner that it is in the knowledge economy if they hadn't made this investment in saying, you know, we want to be a beautiful city as well. Or you look at Washington DC, which has its 11th Street Bridge project, which is all about creating more equitable access across the Anacostia River, um, using beautiful design and community engagement and thinking ahead to um, issues of potential gentrification um, and trying to mitigate them and so on. So there are ways for us to invest in a space like the parkway and also ensure that it doesn't end up displacing more people or creating an unlivable city, but we have to be really thoughtful about it. Um, the one other city that I would point to is, you know, Paris, which has undergone a tremendous transformation in this vision of the 15-minute city where, you know, everyone should be able to access everything that they need within 15 minutes of walking or biking. And this was actually the, the primary um, platform of a mayor running and winning a second term on this idea of the 15-minute city. So, um, these kinds of ideas can galvanize a broad range of people around um, issues of equity, of sustainability, of um, recreational space, of tourism, um, of, of culture and business, all of these various different aspects, but they're not as of right now, ones that I would say are mainstream in Philadelphia. And so sort of I end my, my essay by saying that um, I think the work that we need to do is to find ways to articulate to our representatives if this is something that you're in favor of, um, why a, a, a project like the Parkway is meaningful and important to you, but also to find ways to widen the circle beyond, say, the Philadelphia citizen um, kind of chorus to a much broader group of people who f see themselves in this space and see themselves in this kind of transformation for the city. Um, and then we also then need representatives who are not just listening to constituents but leading as well, who have their minds and hearts um, uh, uh, on these kinds of topics and can find ways to kind of work with their constituents to um, create projects like this. Um, so 
that's sort of uh, the, 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 the general gist of what I, I spoke, wrote about um, in my essay. I'm really excited for our conversation about what big things mean. I think the parkway is just one example, as we'll hear today, about um, other um, potential initiatives that could really transform the city. Um, but I think it's, uh, it's one that we really have to make sure that you know, whoever is the next mayor, the next administration is behind as well. So thanks. Greg? Good evening. Uh, I feel deficient. I don't have an essay. I don't even have a paragraph. Uh, so I'm Greg Reeves, but I am here to help. So I, I, I'd like to take a, a slightly different track because I think about, and in fact, I was just in Barcelona last week, so you couldn't be more right about how they really do emphasize people over, over cars. Uh, but Philadelphia is a city that doesn't really emphasize people over anything. Uh, and I, I would say that uh, being in this city and spending time, and I spent a lot of time in Washington, D.C., too, a beautiful city, but also among the most gentrified cities in the country right now. It used to be called Chocolate City for people that know that. It was 72% black. It's now about 40% black. So the shift has occurred and it's permanent. And in Philadelphia, the, the issue that I look at, and I will talk to the Navy Yard because I think there's relevance. The reason why I'm here is out of frustration, primarily, and pain. Because I spent a long career in the pharmaceutical industry, actually pretty successful in that industry, and moved into real estate. And uh, when I met my, my business partner, we were working at a development company, one of the biggest things that hit me was that there was nobody that looked like me that was making any decisions about things that are being built in a city where most of the people looked like me. And when you face that condition as a person of color and you continue to face it, you deal with two things, frustration and pain. And when it's a wealth building community like this is, I don't know how many people are in real estate development here. Uh, how many people are in real estate development without wealth? Keep your hand up. Okay, so you know, like you, you know what this is about. That when you're in this community and you don't have access to all of the tools that you need to be able to make decisions about your community, you feel frustration and pain. And in a city where we have the highest poverty rate of any major city in the United States, you feel frustration and pain. That's why I got into this business, to try and address that, both at a small scale, but then at the Navy Yard, where we had ended up getting involved. Uh, we work, uh, my partner and I, we. Our company is Mosaic Development Partners. We work in about 10 neighborhoods throughout Philadelphia. We're in Fairhill, we're in Strawberry Mansion, we're in Charleswood, Blumberg, Brewery Town. Uh, we're in Southwest Philly, we're in West Philly, we're in South Philly. Uh, we're, we're working now in, in Frankfurt. We're in Fairhill. We're in neighborhoods where many people who live in Philadelphia and have been there all their lives won't go. We go there because people that look like us need us to be there. They need our investment. They need our thinking. And what we need are people who think bigger about communities that are suffering and marginalized. We need people who are focused on things that are bigger than just buildings. I mean, buildings are great. I'll give it to you. I like buildings. Anybody here doesn't like a building? We like a building. But what matters to us is what happens in those buildings. Who are those buildings for? Who's being welcomed in those buildings? Who are those buildings accessible to? And when you think about that, particularly as a developer and you're putting together your development model, who are you building it for? We know, for the most part, that most developers don't think about BIPOC communities when they're putting together development models. We believe that there are development models that are economically feasible that can include people of color and people that are economically distressed. We believe that not only that's possible, but we try to prove that on a smaller scale. The relevance of the Navy Yard is being able to prove that on a larger scale, on being able to take a large swath of land and 
How many people have been to the Navy Yard? Just a show of hands. It's a beautiful piece of property. How many people of color have been to the Navy Yard? All right, great. I wasn't there. I'd only been there one time before we won the RFP, I must tell you. So I didn't know anything about it. It wasn't a place for me. It's, but once I got there, I was amazed by the vastness of it, its beauty, the serenity of the Navy Yard, the water that's there, the open space. Anybody that goes there today, it is a beautiful place to be and to enjoy. And I thought, well, as a team, and our team, we ended up partnering with a group called Ensemble Investments. They're based in California, but they've got some local folks here who are just terrific, who we work with as a team. But our whole premise was, how are we rethinking the next phase of the Navy Yard that now creates the next new community, one that's resilient, one that takes into account climate change, one that takes into account equity and diversity, and really creating a, what we're calling is a radical welcoming for everyone to come to this space and feel like they can belong. That doesn't come without a lot of intention. It doesn't come without a lot of focus. Our business model, uh, Mosaic, our company, if I step back, has always been about building our business by building other businesses around us and our ecosystem around us. So what that means is we were in a company, we worked for a company where we were never really able to see people, whether they were legal teams, whether they were architects, engineers, other supportive services, the brokerage community where people of color were given leadership positions. So we made it an intention that if we had a company that we would seek out women-owned businesses, BIPOC businesses, where people would have those opportunities with us. Now, for the Navy Yard, think about now doing that on a $2.5 billion project. That's what we're doing. We're taking that to scale, where at every level of the business model that we're building, our professional services staff, our, our engineers, our construction team, our investment team, our, the people who will be using the spaces are all being considered intentionally in an inclusive way. We're doing it because the first thing is that we want to be inclusive. We don't want to exclude people in the way we felt we've been excluded. But secondly, we want to also help solve the poverty problem in Philadelphia. This is, Philadelphia cannot be the great city with a 25% poverty rate. It's impossible to be that city. And it's the responsibility of all of us to recognize that as our own responsibility. We can't just say center city's beautiful, university city's beautiful, but stay away from Kensington and think that that's gonna be okay. It's not. Well, at least it's not for me. So I can't speak for your own heart, but I can speak for my own. That until we start solving those problems as a community, we can't make this city the great city that it deserves to be. And so, as we move forward, the things that we're thinking about, I'll just, I'll be, I'll be fast. I'll share them. I'm riffing, so <laughs> just indulge me for a moment. Thank you. One of the things that we've done in the first phase, first of all, we have a great group, like PIDC, the Philadelphia Industrial Development Corporation, that put out an RFP that really set the tone for inclusion and diversity. And what we did was we responded to that in an incredibly robust way. But what we also did was we wanted to make sure that our programming kind of matched what Philadelphia is going to be. So we have a huge life sciences effort as a part of what we're doing at the Navy Yard. It's well over a billion square feet, maybe close to two million square feet of life sciences that will be coming to the Navy Yard, along with the first time ever that private citizens will be allowed to live there. Uh, we are also bringing small businesses there. We have specific targets for women-owned businesses, minority-owned businesses to operate at the baseline. And also for the first time, we're putting in place a community crowd fund that is citywide where people of low and moderate income can invest along with us in an ownership piece of all the Navy Yard properties that we're moving forward with. So this is something that we've done, Mosaic has done on two prior projects. We're now doing it to scale at the Navy Yard. This is an investment that could be as low as $1,000, and you can own a piece of something that you'd only, in the past, be able to watch happen and not feel as if you're a part of. So we talk a lot about community benefits agreements that happen. Those agreements are typically, and we've been through them in many, in many of our neighborhoods, 
there, uh, a, a discussion with the developer and the, and the residents. They talk about what's being built. They ask for some support for their, their RCOs or for their community groups. They might ask for some annual kind of giving. The developer does it because typically they have an ask, right? They have a need, so they'll do it. And then they kind of go away. What we've done, because we've been so frustrated in our business model that we weren't able to find uh, people that look like us to be able to invest in our projects. Uh, it was, we tried at 100,000, we tried at 50,000, we tried at 25,000, we tried at 5,000. We had no support at those levels. We decided to go to, to a, a crowdfunding source that was first established in the Obama administration, I think in 2009, through the JOBS Act. And through that source, we were able to get now local neighbors to come in and invest as little as $500 in a project that they can now look at across the street and say they own a small piece of it. And so we believe that that is so incredibly important to wealth building, to helping communities think about how they're investing and whether they want to be a part of something and giving them the, the opportunity to be a part of something bigger is what we believe in. So I, I can go on, but I won't. <laughs> and, and I just wanted to give kind of a hint of the things that are coming at the Navy Yard, but we're very excited about the prospects. Thank you. Thanks. Well, I know I could have listened to you talk for another 10 minutes, but <laughs> uh, I will go next. Um, again, I'm Julie D'Onofrio with Penn Praxis, and um, I, I'll be talking about the, the park at Penn's Landing. Um, and really to introduce it, I'm gonna borrow some of the words that Greg used is when we embarked on this project, we were really, we were asked to create a park for all Philadelphians or to develop programming for a park that was for all Philadelphians. And really in order to do that, you have to ask yourself the same question about the buildings. What makes a welcoming park? And you know, do people feel like they belong there? And in order to answer that question, we knew that we could not do this, the engagement process that led um, you know, to the programming for the park alone. Um, you know, so essentially, I guess I'll start from the beginning. Um, for many of you who have been in Philadelphia a long time, you know that the planning for Penn's Landing has been going on for um, 15, 20 years, um, in fact, for, thank you, David. <laughs> 45 years. Um, <laughs> and probably longer. Um, and it has, has had many different, um, you know, characters and, you know, uses. And, um, you know, Harris, who or, uh, helped organize this event and, and couldn't be here tonight, uh, actually worked on the civic vision for the Central Delaware, which was... Um, uh, a visioning project to reimagine what uh, the entire central, seven miles of the central Delaware could be and Penn's Landing being one of those aspects. So, you know, that was 2004, 2006, and you know, we, we are still work, we were still working on this project, um, you know, over a decade later. And in the intervening years, um, the, one of the aspects of the vision for the Central Delaware was the, a cap over I-95 to connect uh, Penn's Landing with, um, with the city of Philadelphia physically. Uh, because the, the divide that I-95 creates, I'm sure as many of you know, um, really you know, breaks up the experience. It, it hinders views to the waterfront, it hinders uh, pedestrian access, and it's actually not terribly easy to navigate as a car or a bike or a bus. <laughs> so it's not just for, for the pedestrians uh, that find it difficult. So this is a project that is many, many years in the making, and um, um, you know, after kind of the vision was set, you know, f much fundraising uh, had to be done, and um, uh, the design firm Hargraves and Associates did uh, many feasibility studies to determine, you know, what was possible. And so, you know, when we we got to the point where. Um, you know, we were asked to come in and do this engagement process, there was already kind of a, a rough blueprint for the park because when it, you, do, you design the, uh, the structure that's gonna be going on uh, over across I-95, there's only so many things that, that you can put in there. We were told numerous times we cannot offer that the Ferris wheel that's currently at Penn's Landing will also be on top of the park uh, for feasibility reasons. So that's just an example of, of um, kind of, 
you know, what, what we are given. We are kind of given a, a few different ways to arrange the plate, but, you know, that the various ingredients on the plate were um, set in some ways. Um, but I think that, you know, so in many ways the design kind of already had a direction, um, and I think that was okay because, um, as we, the way that we went about doing this project is that we, we partnered with um, four community-based, or three nonprofits and one for-profit that, that does a lot of um, engagement called Little Giant Creative. And then we partnered with CMAC, uh, the Village of Arts and Humanities, and Make the World Better Foundation. Because we know, like I said before, we could not do this alone. Um, in order to create a park that is for all Philadelphians, you can't ask the question and wait for people to come to you. We had to go to them. We also had to imagine what the possibilities of this park might be and ask very specific questions about you know, the programming that makes a, um, a, a vibrant public space. So we had, we held seven, or seven topic-based focus groups and three neighborhood-specific focus groups um, in 2019 and early 2020. And some of those topics range from uh, intergenerational play, um, food as social capital, cultural entrepreneurship, um, and probably the one that was most interesting to me uh, was freedom in public space. Uh, and that was hosted with our partners, the Village of Arts and Humanities. Uh, and, and frankly, um, I had never, realized that all of the great public spaces in Philadelphia and in other cities that I have always felt incredibly welcome in and enjoy with a blanket and friends, to some members of our city and our community, they have never felt welcome. And um, Rittenhouse Square, Schoolkill, uh, Banks, um, the current Penn's Landing, um, and so it just really kind of stopped me in my tracks to think, you know, if we're going to be designing uh, parks and, and creating new public space that are really for everybody, um, it's not just about the design, uh, but it's actually how these spaces are uh, signed, how they are managed, whether or not they have curfews, um, lighting. All it's it's really about like, well, how did. How do you, what's happening in that park and do I feel welcome based on what's happening there? Or is, is it a sanitized place that, that is beautiful and has you know, amazing pristine gardens, but maybe, maybe people don't see um, someone else like them in that space and that kind of changes how it feels. So I think um, you know, through this process, um, we definitely got a lot of feedback that, that we shared with the design team that they have executed. Um, Things like, uh, you know, more places with shade and, you know, smaller ga gathering areas for, um, you know, benches and for people to convene with, you know, having, um, you know, family reunions and picnics and, and places for buskers and places for people to sell their wares and, you know, all sorts of things. So all the things that make a, a, a great um, urban park. And so, um, you know, frankly, the, the design has really just been completed. And um, after that, construction will begin. And truly, this park, that which we're all discussing, will not actually be you know, here for us to enjoy for still several years. So really, many of these, the questions about you know, how, are, how is a park run and how is it managed? Um, and are there going to be like, beneficial employment strategies that are going to um, provide mutual benefit for, for many, many residents of the city? These are all questions that still have to be asked asked and still have to be acted upon. And, um, you know, the organization that will be running this park is the Delaware River Waterfront Corporation. And so, you know, they are all grappling with, with all of these questions while, you know, they're also trying to, to manage their other spaces and whatnot. So I don't put the responsibility all on them to, to do things differently than, than how other parks are managed. But, um, but really, that I think this should be a call and a consideration to, to anyone, like the next time that you go into an urban public space and you know, look around and you know, see who's there and, and who feels comfortable. And are you know, our, our folks being you know, asked to be shooed away if they're you know, sh sleeping on a bench or whatnot? I mean, these are the things that are really 
in difficult challenges because, um, you know, there are different preferences and pu pu public space is truly for everybody. So if public space really is, is for everybody, how, how are we able to, um, to accommodate uh, all of those, all of the people of, of our great city in these spaces and make everybody feel welcome? So, thank you. Great. Well, Julie, that's a great uh, segue into my first question. So all of your, all the spaces you've been talking about, they're really big, pretty significant open spaces. Uh, there's been a lot of public discourse recently about how the city's big open spaces should be used and what for and what issues should they uh, deal with. So I'm curious from all of you, so how do these projects respond to competing interests, right? People think that things should be used in different ways or to manage different issues. How do these projects respond to competing interests? Um, sure, I'll, I'll go first. Um, I, so I think for, from my interpretation of the design for the reimagined parkway, it, it seems to me like the idea is um, to welcome all Philadelphians, but to also really prioritize people over cars. I think that is sort of, you know, that's m dealing with two different competing issues that are have been, you know, historic on the parkway for a really long time. And it was a pretty brave... Um, and I think it was selected because it was so strongly and forcefully saying, you know, we really need to reclaim this space for Philadelphians, any Philadelphian, not just car owners, not just people who are commuting to and from along the parkway. Um, and so I think that it's, it's going to be a challenge and it's definitely going to be like when this kind of comes up for discussion and community debate and whatever else, like that's going to be um, a sticking point. But I also think it's like we've spent the past century, this parkway is 100 years old, we've spent, spent the past century essentially with a, a certain agreement in place where we've said, okay, cars get this much space, pedestrians get this much space, and we've kind of tested that out. And I think that this is kind of like the next iteration of recognizing that we're in 2022 now, and we're only going to a future in which, um, you know, climate change is only going to be more of an issue. Gas prices are only going to get higher. In inequality and equity is only going to become a bigger issue. How are we going to address that? And so I think this is a vision for the parkway that really kind of tries to grapple with that in a different way that it has in the past. Um, and those are, those are some of the competing interests. I mean, I think that's part, there's like so many other ones, right? Of course. Um, but that to me seems like that's the big, the big tension on the parkway is really between the traffic that we have traditionally had there and the need for um, a, a space that is going to serve a vast swath of Philadelphians, tourists, and so forth. Great. Well, I think that's great. Did you want to also address that? I can certainly I can comment on anything. I, that's, <laughs> I have no problem with that. So whether I have the ex expertise or not, it won't stop me. So I, what's interesting is I just coming back from Spain uh, and spending time in Barcelona and then Madrid, the respect for the public realm is so much higher there than it is here. It's kind of, it's striking to see uh, how those spaces have been curated. And you talked about 100 years. I was in Zagovia and I saw the aqueduct that was built in the year 98. And so when you think about buildings that were built in the year 98 or 500 or 700, we're talking about things that are 50 years old here and crumbling. Uh, and the reality is that we don't have a really good plan for the public realm. And we aren't respecting public space and we aren't designing adequately public space. We have city planners here. I'm sure there's city planners in the room. When I think about Philadelphia being 50% impervious and think about the effects that that has on, on the climate problem that we have, that there's no place for, for rainwater to go, right? It's just rolling essentially downhill. It's overfilling our stormwater systems. 
it's having a real effect and we have no real discussion about that, even with the city agencies, we have the land bank, we have others that control large swaths of land. What is our plan for creating more pervious space, uh, creating greater density in this space, creating and, and, and planting more trees? Trees have both an ecological benefit, but they have a human benefit of people's lives. When you go into neighborhoods and you see more trees being built, there's, there's safety that comes with those spaces. And so we can, have, we can have economic conversations, we could have climate conversations, and we can have human conversations that can take us to the same place if we can get together and really get people making decisions in the right way. Could I just quickly add one more thing, which is that I feel like actually the real the real debate there is on the parkway is kind of between the way that we've always done things and the way that we could be doing things in the future. You know, like that's really the, we've, that's the, the scary part of like blowing this up and changing it and whatnot. How can we start to actually be as a city forward thinking, anticipating, rather than just doing things as we always have. And that's like that's the competing interest between people who want to do things as we always have versus like actually recognizing where we are now and how we have to build things, do things differently, respond differently. I agree, and I just wanted to add to that that I think um, when you asked the question initially, Martha, I was thinking that's a tough one, you know, how do, how do we, uh, you know, let everything that, that needs to happen in public space happen? But I think it's not just trying to say, okay, everything has a spot and everything has a role and we need to fit it all in. But I think it's, you know, are we listening to everybody who has a say and giving uh, residents as equal say as what, you know, traditional policymakers, you know, unilateral decisions or whatnot. And I think that, to your point, is kind of the way of can we actually do things differently rather than talk about doing things th differently? So maybe that's one way to think about it. <laughs> I think that's a great point. And I think talking about, you know, changing the way we do things, that's a big, that's a competing interest, right? To think about. <laughs> right. How about um, just doing something? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I want to go back. Greg started talking a little bit about climate change. And I do want to talk about all three of these projects <clears throat> are on the riverfront. And, and so certainly you've been thinking about, I'm sure, uh, climate change and resiliency. So I, I want each of you to, if you have opportunity, to talk a little bit about how you see this project. What's this project's role uh, in, in resiliency for the city? Sure, go. Can, uh, I mean, I think it's, yeah. a, it's a huge, it's just a huge net gain for sustainability for Philadelphia. I mean, just, you know, to Greg's point about pervious space, like just the amount of space that would be dedicated to green space would be just huge. Um, but also thinking about like, how are we going to plant that space? Thinking about it as like those pollinator gardens, thinking about it as an ecosystem, that would be a huge change in how we think about the parkway. Um, providing access down to the waterfront, I think, would also just change how people see themselves being near the waterfront. And I think, you know, one of the things that I will say, you know, just whenever you experience free spaces in Philadelphia, like that's where you see everybody. Like it's the free spaces, it's the parks, that's where you see this tremendous diversity of all Philadelphians in those spaces. And um, providing more access to the waterfront is a huge way to just kind of change up who is see seeing themselves on that waterfront. Um, and um, so anyways, to get to the point of sustainability though, I think it would just kind of engage people in thinking about um, the ecosystem that like we actually have another river there that um, plays a really big part in the, in our city and, um, and how that all connects. And obviously, um, thinking about the parkway as being more of a green space that is not just sort of encouraging um, cars, but other, you know, pedestrian, bicycling, et cetera, exercising, other activities, just completely changes the mindset of, um, of that space to being a more sustainable one. Well, we hired, uh, so, 
Uh, once we were awarded the opportunity to redevelop the next phase of the Navy Yard, we, the first thing we did was engage in a new or an updated plan. And so we hired James Corner Field Operations, uh, who is really a world leader in land planning and working on kind of world-class land design. And we think we've come up with a world-class plan that is both resilient, but really does capture the elements of what's necessary in the future of land development, particularly in the midst of climate change. Uh, we're looking at issues regarding full resiliency of our streets. Uh, we're looking at the distance that buildings should be from the shore, what the treatment should be from the shore, how buildings should be raised. And they are, new buildings are already raised at the Navy Yard, but we're talking about districts of being raised. We plan on being the first lead for development gold neighborhood district in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, we have really taking into consideration things like swales, canals, dry ponds, really taking seriously every element of how we're building uh, this next ecosystem so that it's designed appropriately to capture and address really the climate that's coming in the next 100 years. Uh, what I will say is that uh, as we're looking at climate change, we also have to look at the rest of the city of Philadelphia. And we need a Philadelphia plan around climate change, impervious and impervious spaces, and how not only that affects kind of places where there's significant investment, but also our neighborhoods. You know, we have seriously underinvested under neighborhoods throughout the city of Philadelphia, and we can point to the neighborhoods. Many of us know them, some of us don't, but those neighborhoods need a plan too. And until we all are working together on a full climate plan for the city of Philadelphia, my goal, the big idea is that we're the world leader as a city or the national leader as a city in how we address resiliency, not only in neighborhoods that are wealthy, but also in neighborhoods that aren't. You know, how do we address job growth and creation for BIPOC and women-led businesses? Why can't we be the leader there too? So if we have big ideas, let's have big community-based ideas that also have economic benefits. But climate is, uh, I think, a great start for us. Yeah, I mean, I think at, at Penn's Landing, it's, it's kind of like what you, Diana, was saying about the waterfront. You know, it's, the park is going to be designed to, to respond to, you know, sea level rise in, in, in so far as, you know, it is, it's a porous, place that, you know, can respond to those, um, you know, different shifts and changes. But I, I think what probably the most important thing that the park is doing in its current design is just adding a ton of green, porous, pervious space to a, a place that is completely covered by concrete right now. Uh, we'll add a lot of trees, a lot of, you know, gardens with pollinators, some of the, some of the same terms you were using. And so, you know, it's a it's a small piece, but I think it is it is being responsive um, and really taking those considerations into heart. Um, again, I'm not part of the design team, so I can't speak on their behalf. But I know all of those good principles and sentiments went into it. Um, there is a question about the the remainder of the development that will be happening around the park um, because you know. For those of you who haven't seen the renderings and the images, you know this is—it's really kind of the the heart of what will then be surrounded by by future development on to the north and to the south. So um, I can't speak to how how those projects are responding, but I believe it is is more with kind of a an eye towards you know lead certification and, and green building design, um, and so trying to make an impact there where they can. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to come in with a couple of questions, too. Um, I just wanted to take this opportunity to say that at next month's meeting of the Design Advocacy Group, the, the park at Penn's Landing will be presented. And Marsha, I bet you remember the date of it. Yes, um, May 19th. May 19th at 10 a.m. Um, uh, DAG, uh, 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 it'll be a virtual meeting, um, and these plans will be, I think, probably the first public unveiling of them. Um, they go to the Art uh, Commission the next month. I believe so, yes. So you'll get to hear from um, Mary Margaret Jones and um, Richard Maimon from Karen Timberlake, who did the building on the park. So, <laughs> and listen, there you go. <laughs> 
So, so my first, my question that I'd love to hear from each of you about is that, of course, Philadelphia has done big things in the past, but this is a different time, and you're all engaged in reporting on or creating big things. And we've heard some indications of just how different it is now, but some of these things haven't been finished yet. And what is it going to take to get them to the finish line at this time? I, I really think that we need a champion in the next mayor for the parkway. Um, we need someone who makes this a priority, who sees the vision for it, um, who's going to put the money behind it, who's going to rally people around it. We, I don't think if we have someone who's not excited about it, like, how is this going to get done? It's not. So, I mean, I think if it's, you know, an issue that is... I think it's a critical one to, to address for the next mayor. There's a plan here that's sitting ready for them. Um, and so I think, I think it really requires that kind of um, a, a mayor who's willing to stand by it and, and sort of marshal the administration around it. Um, that I think is critical for the parkway. I mean, obviously like you also need funding <laughs> money um, and we've been getting that for some unusual sources lately um, with federal funding so who knows where we'll be in the next couple of years maybe there'll be new infrastructure dollars that would be supportive of that um, you know local philanthropy and so forth I think obviously we'll need neighbors residents, et cetera, to support this kind of project um, on an ongoing basis to just sort of support the maintenance and so on. But like the real dollars are going to either have to come from city, state, federal funds, probably. Yeah. But I, I don't see this going forward without a mayor who's in favor of it. I'll respond. I, I think that, you know, I have I'm able to speak about a project that already is funded and is, uh, I think, yeah, <laughs> that uh, will be breaking down soon. And you know, same with the the surrounding development. But I feel uh, the challenge for the park at Penn's Landing is for if there aren't folks from other from all across the city again who feel welcome there, or you know, they're cousin has a business there, they want to patronize, you know, like if it's really not drawing in a meaningful manner from, from across the city, then it's not going to feel any different than like a signature waterfront park. And so I feel like the, the challenge there is not whether it will be built and whether it will be realized because it will be, and it will be beautiful. But I feel like for it to be a true Philadelphia park, with all of the, you know, amazing people and the grittiness and the character and, you know, what have you. Can't think of another adjective right now. Um, but you know what I mean? <laughs> that park. <laughs> if it's going to be, uh, you know, something that feels like this city, then it really is going to have to draw people from all over. And in order for that to happen, people need to see themselves there. So I, you know, I would love to borrow your notes on, you know, how you, small business incubation, you know, very even small dollar amounts get your foot in the door. Like those sorts of mechanics are very much needed even after the park itself is built. Well, I'm very interested in the idea, again, just coming back from Europe that, and seeing, I don't know if anybody's seen Gaudi and any of the Gaudi work, but uh, if you look at that, and then we went to Cordoba and saw the mosque, which is an amazing structure. None of those were built in a lifetime. And I, I am not naive to think that the change that I'm looking for will happen in my lifetime, nor do I care. The question is, what am I doing to move the ball forward around a big idea without worrying about whether it happens on my watch or not? I'm not that worried about that. I'm more concerned about how I get up every day, what impact I have every day, and whether I'm doing something that I'm satisfied with in my work and the work around me. And so our goal has never been one that was kind of executing these beautiful buildings. It was always around building an ecosystem where people felt that they were being included. 
and invested in and had an opportunity to do things that others weren't giving them an opportunity to do themselves because that's what I was feeling. So I didn't want others to feel the same feeling I had, this kind of inequity that was going on in my life because I never felt, my father was a military officer in the, in the 50s. So you can imagine kind of the strength of character he had during that time. But he never raised me to believe that I was less than anybody. And I never believed that. And so to come into communities where you're kind of put it to the side or not given the opportunity to lead, it was something that was just, I couldn't live with professionally. And so that is what drives me every day more than finishing a building or complete, I certainly have to finish buildings because our investors <laughs> will be very upset if we don't. So they have to be open and operating, and they will be. But our bigger goal, the big idea, is to move a narrative forward about equity and about what's possible and about bringing people, all people, into the opportunity of being able to build community wealth. And if that happens past my watch, I'm thrilled. I'd like it to happen fast. I'd like this not to be a marathon and more of a race, but, but so be it, either way. That was, a, that was the, applause, the applause I think you waited for, but uh, the... Uh, oh, <laughs> I think that was my wife. <laughs> Thanks, honey, uh, I'll, see, I'll see you there. <laughs> so these are big projects, physically big projects, expensive projects, impactful projects in ways of a very substantial, you know, a very social, social impact as well, certainly, particularly as Greg, as you've talked about. But they still are big projects in one corner of the city. And this is a really big city. It's miles and miles and miles away. And I've just say, personally, one of the things that struck me in thinking about, in looking at the projects proposed for the parkway was how astonishingly blind they were to public transportation. And, um, and I'd have to point out the obvious fact is that the Broad Street subway doesn't actually go to the Navy Yard. It's a little short, but... Yeah, thanks for the reminder. But, but, uh, but I mean... And, I'd and, love it and, to. And, and, and Penn's Landing is on the other side. Well, we're going to bridge it by 95. But quite seriously, I mean, how do, how do you make something that is so big and so expensive, but so physically far away from mu the majority of this big diverse city function, as you're all saying, for the whole city? Is it just a... Right here. <laughs> Septa. Right here. <laughs> we, well, we concur. I, I, thought the I thought the solution was electric scooters for everyone. No, sorry. Uh, uh, that too, electric electric bikes, e-bikes. I, I if I was if, I was going to reverse the order. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Reverse no, order. go for it. Reverse order. Um, well, it's interesting you say that because I know Penn's Landing is actually the closest to public transportation of the projects mentioned, but it doesn't change the fact that you know I'm a city planner. I love to talk about public transportation, but there are many folks. Um, for, for whom that's just not feasible because you're bringing your five kids or your mother, you know, who, ha even if there, it's not a disability, just, you know, mobility challenges. And actually one of the, the focus groups of the 10 that we had was about accessibility. Um, and, you know, which covered a, a range of topics, but actually it came up so many times over the course of the focus groups, no matter where it was, that in order to make the park relevant, to broad parts of Philadelphia, there needed to be ways to get there other than uh, than public transportation because the fact is is that they're taking away a lot of parking in order to build the future development. Parking is already $17 a day. It's probably gonna be more expensive with inflation. And so it, there isn't really a, a replacement for um, you know folks who had been going to the Great Plaza, which is an amazingly um, diverse uh, place in the city now, but we're, we're using a car to get there. And so, you know, we came up with, you know, the Philly Flash that, that goes around to, to some of the, the cultural areas. I don't know, it was a, it, it's an interesting idea to think about, you know, could, Sep, could SEPTA or another uh, group, you know, have kind of a, you know, neighborhood shuttle for, for some of these public spaces. I'm, I'm just passing on what, what 
residents told us, but I do think that, um, yeah, I, I would like to hear what, what my fellow panelists have to say about that as well. So at the Navy Yard, uh, and we have, we've had many conversations with SEPTA and they've actually been incredibly productive. You have to think about the Navy Yard when it was first constituted, it wasn't designed to have people go there. It was actually a, an intentional barrier because it was the Navy Yard, right? So it was a military ins installation. They didn't particularly want people there and now it's changed. And so uh, when we're looking at it, and particularly Leslie and I getting into uh, the development of Navy Yard being new, one of the big things that caught us was the fact that public transportation wasn't particularly accessible. There is a shuttle there. Uh, the, the, the train does stop uh, right at the stadium district. Uh, there isn't a really great way to get there. And if you walk there, as I have many times past FDA Park, it's actually quite dangerous for me to, but I do it anyway, but it's still not the safest experience. Uh, one of the things that you look at when you're building affordable neighborhoods, and that's one of the real key elements of how we're thinking about the Navy Yard. It's not, many people focus uniquely on housing affordability, but the second largest cost is the cost of your automobile. And if you're on a fixed income or if you're a lower moderate income person, that car cost can be the difference between you having any disposable income in your family. And so that's why having accessible public transportation is so important to families, particularly families that do have moderate wages. So we're looking at we would love to have the subway extend. We've been told that the cost is well over a billion dollars, so that check has not been written yet. Uh, we, if it were to happen, we're always open to that, but we're looking at more immediate uh, opportunities. We think something called BRT, which is a bus rapid transit system, could be a really effective tool. We're actually talking with SEPTA now about how to engage in a pilot program to get that moving. We're also having the first at the Navy Yard, the autonomous vehicle pilot that's coming in August. It'll be the first in the Commonwealth in the state of Pennsylvania to occur. We're also looking at e-bikes and different trails that we're designing. We're looking at connectivity of all of the trail systems that will start with the Navy Yard. So we're thinking of a multimodal approach because we do know how important that is to affordability, particularly for people who are marginalized. And, and that's something that's very important to us. It's a solution that has a big cost to it. But we're not willing to just say, if, if the subway doesn't extend, we'll do nothing. So, so we do have other plans to, to move beyond that. Yeah, I would just say, um, well, the parkway was initially intended to be this conduit to Fairmount Park. And then there's never been a way to like actually access Fairmount Park from the city. So um, I think of it almost less of like, how do we get people to the parkway, which feels relatively, you know, covered. There are four different bus lines that go along the parkway and stop at 21st in the parkway. You know, there's there are transit systems that get you to and from the parkway. Um, there's not a ton that get you out of the city into Fairmount Park, um, and there's not a ton that will get you from the parkway to some of you know the the obviously the neighborhoods that are not covered um, by those various different bus lines. Um, so you know, I would love to see something more like um, you know, there's the flash that goes to all the various different um, arts institutions and cultural institutions, but like a flash of, um, you know, uh, recreational spaces in the city that would be able to take you from, you know, the parkway out to farther reaches in different neighborhoods um, along Fairmount Park, because it extends so, so, um, so much farther. Um, but I would say, you know, for those events that you have on the parkway, like an Eagles parade or whatnot, people find a way to get downtown to, you know, and walk in. It's not, you know, um, maybe it's not the, the kind of thing that if you were like daily commuting there, that it would, would not be feasible, but for a day trip or something like that, I don't think the parkway is super inaccessible. There's some, there's decent transit opportunities and ways to walk in. Okay, so I think we have reached the important part of the program where we take questions from the audience, um, which you may direct at an individual or at all three, or, you know, just 
stand up and ask a question. Um, we'll do this by raising hands. And Ryan will come around with the microphone. So you want to start in that corner, Ryan? So this is a question actually for all five of you. I think all the projects are exciting, but one of my questions and is they're all aimed at the eastern side of the city. And as we were talking about neighborhoods that some of us don't know, have never been to, where's that next big project? Why, when are we gonna get a big project in a neighborhood where we've never invested. I see what's happening in Cobbs Creek. We're just, no, I don't think it's a good thing. We're putting a private golf course kind of thing there. That's not public. Tell me about that project. That's the one I want to know about. FDR Park, that seems like a different. It's, I think they're getting rid of the golf course. I think there's a, a pretty decent investment in, in FDR Park for a number of different purposes there, not just one single purpose. I would say that would be one example outside of um, this realm that we're speaking of. Just throwing out that out there. Well, well, I have a favorite project that reaches the entire city, and that's um, a historic river uh, rivers um, uh, project that would pull in Cobbs Creek and Pennypack Creek and maybe some of the creeks that aren't creeks anymore, um, but would literally be a network of green also through the city. Ryan, do you want to person right here? Hi, thanks. Um, Jeff Hornstein from the Economy League. Greg, I'm a huge fan of what Mosaic is doing um, and the whole collective in general. Um, we have a history, I think, in the city of not doing things because we always expect the public sector to do them for us, right? And part of that's because we haven't had a functioning real estate market in 50 years, and now we do, right? Development is happening. Um, I think the Delaware waterfront is a huge success. Right? I was, if you go back and read Steve McGovern's article from the 90s where he lays out all the plans, that grandiose plans for Delaware Waterfront, then Mike Nutter, to give him credit, came in and said, hey, let's just do little things to spark private development. It's been enormously successful, I think. So we're growing. We have the potential to address some of these poverty issues because we are finally growing and managing growth. Um, you know, poverty issues, where did they come from? They came from white and capital flight from 1950 to 1995, right? It's a huge problem to solve, but it's not a totally insolvable problem. But I would like to point to sort of challenge you a little bit because there are some pretty good plans uh, for, for resiliency right now coming out of the mayor's office of sustainability mostly, the decarbonization plan, um, there's green, you know, green works. There have been a lot of plans. The question for us is where do we get the resources, right? We live in Pennsylvania, state's not gonna provide the resources for the most part. Luckily, we have another year or so of Biden, hopefully longer, but there will be some federal dollars, but where do we find the resources for these things? Um, so but my questions are, why not a streetcar or BRT that goes from City Hall all the way up to, let's say, the Japanese house or Please Touch, right? That doesn't seem like a terribly expensive project if you did BRT. One of my favorites is a water taxi that takes you from Center City to the Navy Yard. We already have the rights of way and we already own the boats. Most people don't know that, but we do. Um, if we got a few more boats, cheap, easy, accessible. So I'll leave you with that. Thanks, Jeff. Is that a question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, The, the flash does go to please touch. Um, so that trolley kind of does exist, but it doesn't go farther than that. And could, I mean, there's, there's way more Philadelphia. And I think there, there are, there are ways to get people to like, why don't we have access to like the Belmont plateau, like by transit, you know, why there are just so many other areas of green space in the city and like our green space is not connected by public transit. So like thinking of that as, a, as its own destination rather than just 
um, specific cultural institutions. I think the the water taxi idea sounds cool. I, w I, I would be in favor of that. And um, who wouldn't want to take a water taxi instead of the subway? So. <laughs> I'm not a fan of the water taxi. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, and I see that, look, they're all throughout DC. They use them a lot. Alexandria, National Harbor, the wharf, the Navy Yard. But those are cities that have wealth, right? The water taxi came after. It didn't come at a 25% poverty rate. I think we have bigger things to invest in. The water taxi, I think, is a good idea, provided that the other ideas that really help us get out of a greater poverty situation uh, go first. So for me, it's what comes first. Not that I wouldn't do any of those ideas. I think they're all good ideas. Yeah. I, I, I hear you, but we've, we've looked at, uh, I've looked at the numbers at least down in other markets and they, they were money losers actually. I would say that uh, IKEA provides a free water taxi between Brooklyn and the South Street Seaport, and like that could be an interesting way. Is are, are there are there private uh, support for free public transportation that could actually um, get people to the Navy Yard or other places that would subsidize the transportation? Hi, I have a question, I think for D Diana, um, about the uh, project that you were speaking about. I'm just wondering, like I live in Mount Airy and Kelly Drive is a way for us to get downtown um, and pretty quickly and to access Kelly Drive. So I'm just wondering what you would propose as a way for people to get into the city because 76, 676, those are already, um, those are already pretty crowded. And we know that with the pandemic, car usage has gone up dramatically. So I'm just yeah. wondering, when you reimagine this space, how do you imagine it being accessible to all Philadelphians? Yeah, so I, it's, it's a good question, and I think this, again, it comes to the competing interest question. Um, when you look at the proposal that Design Workshop laid out, they take a lot of different exits out and a lot of different entry points to the city out, right? But it doesn't eliminate them. So instead of, you know, essentially exiting into the city around Spring Garden, it might be more Girard Avenue, you know? And so, yes, it's going to add time to people's commute, or it might mean that you have to take 676 into the city, further into the city, rather than exiting on the parkway. And I think that, you know, one of the things that will remain to be seen is like, you know, what what the commuter situation looks like when this is built. The amount of, you know, people who are commuting five days a week into the city has dramatically dropped. It's had a big impact on, you know, those key rush hour times, making it easier for the people who are actually coming into the city and you know, maybe reducing the amount of traffic at those times for people. So um, you know, it's gonna be a pain point for people and um, I, I think about it, I, I would, you know, I, I live in Fairmount, it would be the, according to their plan, they'd be eliminating like all my main accesses to the highways that I'm able to get as well. But I think it's sort of like, a shared sacrifice that people would have to make in order to 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 make this a reality for for everyone to enjoy in a way and to make this space truly um, truly special. So, um, you know, it may end up changing, but I think that it's like it, the city wouldn't become inaccessible. And it, it's one of those things that I've also noticed about like how the Parkway works right now, where it's like there's you know you're moving at really great speeds up until like you know, 21st Street, and then you hit transit, and so, like, traffic and whatnot, it it probably would end up moving it back to, like, 29th Street, you know? Like, you're still going to hit the traffic. It's going to happen a little bit earlier. Maybe different commuting um, patterns will end up changing how people are actually, how many people are accessing the city. And maybe it's also, like, if we undertake this project, we actually have to start thinking about other transportation options, other ways that we're actually providing for people to get into the city. Uh, for the gentleman who's in the jacket, I lived in Paris and London and Rome, and believe me, the traffic is not that bad. 
But I'm going to tell you, Philadelphia's got the worst traffic I've ever seen in my whole life. And I'm 75 years old and I can prove it. <laughs> Try to get from one point of Philadelphia down to Center City. It's like going through a, um, a monkey maze. You will get there and you stop. The traffic is so tied up between 15th Street and 30th Street, you wonder how the heck you can get around and try to get around it. East River Drive, disaster. West River Drive, disaster. Anywhere you try to get in this city, it's like, you know, you just cannot focus on how you get downtown. When you get in town, all right, you, you're there. But to get out, well, let's put it this way. You, you, you're playing suicide with your life. <laughs> so on that note is, I hope SEPTA in the near future who will extend the, extend the um, Frankfurt, um, Frankfurt line off to whatever that thing's out there, the mall out there, which would be great because like people want to go that way. And even go to King of Prussia. You got to either take the 123 or the 125. And you really, you don't really don't even think you get there on time. That's the problem, Philadelphia. You got to start working on the transit, man. It's bad. Yeah. It's the worst I've ever seen. I think we're at a tipping point a bit in terms of the traffic because it's like it's been easy to drive in Philadelphia for a long time and people are accustomed to that. If you live in New York City, like everyone takes transit everywhere. No one would ever think to drive anywhere because it's just going to be impossible to park. And we're sort of at a tipping point right now. Like we haven't figured out how we're going to actually accommodate people to get around. Like we need a more robust transit system. No. For sticking with um, East and West River Drive as <laughs> an indication of a of a genuine long-time Philadelphian. So my question's for everyone. I'm Josh Lippert. I was the former floodplain manager for the city of Philadelphia. Uh, my question is, are we thinking big enough, and are you, as private developers, thinking big enough about our long-term future? You all said it's the city's responsibility for resiliency. None of you have addressed how your developments are going to be impacted by the data and the science we have related to flooding and sea level rise. The building we sit in today had six feet of water during Hurricane Ida eight months ago. New building, hundreds if not millions of dollars worth of damage, just this one building. The Navy Yard, the data and the science published by the city in 2015 shows it'll be inundated by 2050 if not 2080, and one hurricane this hurricane season could cause upwards of $2 billion worth of damage in Philadelphia. Not just the Navy Yard, the airport, all of the Delaware River, and the Schuylkill River. So my question is, are we thinking big enough? Are we actually learning from the past Fairmont Park was created to protect water quality as well as natural floodplains. I-95 cap is filling in the floodplain. Your projects, you said, are filling in the floodplain to build higher, but not thinking about infrastructure underground that will be inundated, risking businesses, life, property. In your, your project, although more resilient to flooding and, and sea level rise, the access to the riverfront, are we thinking about long-term operational and response? After Hurricane Ida, it took volunteers to clean up waterfronts. Our city staff couldn't do it alone. And I haven't heard any of you talk about how you really are gonna plan for the future with the data and science that's known today. I thought I did, but I thought I did. No, that's no, no. no I, I talked about bioswells. We talked about resiliency. We talked about doing dry ponds. We, we, we have a whole program. In fact, we're having an unveiling May twelfth that you're invited to come to. It will be addressed by sea level rise. We have been. We have seen all of the data that you're referring to. We've certainly been meeting on it for months and months. I feel very confident that with the investment we're making, that we're addressing it in an appropriate way. I certainly understand your passion. And it's our passion as well. It's something we're incredibly committed to, and I, I feel confident that 
the program we have in place is going to work. I'll address the the question that I can't fully answer about what the developers of the uh, sites on uh, the Delaware waterfront will do. Um, I, I, those sites are currently being RFP'd, and so the the really it is still up to the developers to make those decisions because I, I know that the developer for the site north of Penn's Landing has been selected, um, Durst, um, but. We're talking about five, 10 years um, for the remainder of those waterfront parcels to even be development ready. Um, I might have my years slightly off, but I do think that there is still probably uh, flex room for increased advocacy for those issues to be addressed because um, I, they, they truly haven't adequately been, you know, they've kind of started with the public spaces as anchors um, for that, the Delaware River development. Um, and really now is the first time we're really seeing buildings rise out of those parcels. So I think it's still an open question, frankly. Thank you. Uh oh, I'm loud, I don't need this. <laughs> oh, uh, okay. Actually, uh, I think, I think they okay. Oh, sorry, can everyone hear me? Um, so I just wanted to first say, I just moved back from uh, the West Coast, and Gregory, it is great to see the work that you were doing. I was kind of unfamiliar that it existed here, and so coming back, it's great to see. And then uh, my next, I'm gonna pander some more. Um, and Diana, I don't mean to beat you up. I feel like <laughs> you've had a rough go, but uh, I'm gonna pander Septa here a little bit. And I guess my question is, uh, we talked a lot about like Paris and Barcelona and a lot of these European cities and how they put kind of people over cars. And it seems like a lot of them have built a strong infrastructure of uh, like subway systems and public transportation to support that ideology. So I guess would it make sense to kind of focus that first before we build all these green parks and stuff? But I love a park. It's just, it, I guess, that would be my question. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, yes, I would wholeheartedly endorse a stronger transit system. I guess the question is sort of what to do with the parkway as it exists right now. Um, and uh, is it living up to its potential as it exists right now? Um, is it as sustainable, as resilient as it could be right now? Is it serving Philadelphians as well as it could right now? Um, and uh, and I think that there's been sort of an 100 year debate about this. And I think in general, we've sort of come to the agreement that uh, that no, it's 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 really it's servicing not Philadelphia's um, best interests as it's currently configured. So the idea of strengthening the public transit system before we, you know, change the parkway, um, that seems like a tall order. And I think we've also had tremendous demonstration projects. Yeah, no, I was just gonna say, we've had tremendous demonstration projects that have shown, like we've done the oval project for multiple years that have brought people to a Aiken's Oval. Um, we have transformed Sister Cities Park into a tremendous park. And we've seen how these various different ways, we've closed off lanes of the parkway to traffic and use them for bicyclists and pedestrians. Like we've used all these various different pilot projects to test like can the parkway sustain this kind of transformation? I think the answer is yes. And I think that if we did commit to this, it's like it's this three-legged stool issue of, you know, what will push us to invest in public transportation? I don't think that w say, putting the carrot of the parkway out there is going to do that. I think it's saying, you know, uh, we we prioritize non-car uh, uh, solutions to get mobil mobility solutions, uh, that that will actually activate people to be focused on public transportation, on bikes, on e-bikes, on scooters, on walking, on all the various other different options. So um, yeah, that would be my thought there. 
I want to thank everybody. Um, I just wanted to give the panelists an opportunity for a last and final thought before we wrap things up. Greg, would you like to kick us off? Thank you for coming. <laughs> Support the citizen. <laughs> to borrow what from Diana said pre uh, previously, uh, advocate for strong leadership that's gonna make all of these collective visions possible and more in the future. Thank <laughs> you.